Welcome everyone to Ask the Pastor. I'm your host, Blake Gideon, Senior Pastor of Edmonds First Baptist Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. I've got my hat on today because I have been out on the street preaching today at the abortion mill, pleading with women not to murder their children, um, and also preaching the gospel. I do have uh, three questions for today, and uh, very good questions. To I mean, I had to do a little bit of research uh, before I got on today's podcast. So here's the first question. It says, what are your thoughts on 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16 on head coverings? It has been something that has been stirring in my heart. I've heard various views on it, particularly verse 10 about the angels and the physical act of wearing something on your head. Okay, well, there is much debate about this. Uh, some church traditions believe that a woman, a woman in church ought to have her head covered and a man ought to have his head uncovered. Uh, let me read the passage just for a moment. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, this is what it says. Um, now I commend because uh, I commend you because you you remember me and everything and maintain traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and that the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his own head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven for if a wife for if a wife will not cover her head then she shall cut her hair short but since it is disgraceful disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or to shave her head let her cover her head okay so let's talk about that Obviously, there's some debate about this. Some people believe it's a literal hair co uh, covering, but I would say that more modern scholars, and I'm, my mouth is dry, I've got to get some water. Most modern, well, not say most, but there's a move towards modern scholarship that says, well, this isn't talking about like a veil or a head covering, literally. It's talking about a hairdo or a hairstyle. Uh, because he goes on to talk about um, if you're not going to cover your head, then shave your head. Um, so some people think that a, w a woman in worship should cover her head with some type of veil. Other people believe that a woman should have her hair up in a bun. That this is talking about the fact that her hair shouldn't be long, but it should be up in a bun. Okay. Um, now, why is that? Why did Paul, either way, want a woman to have her hair covered? Or why did he want the hair up in a bun? Why, if Depending on how you translate it. Well, I've pulled two resources here that I want to read from. This is the Baker Exegetical Commentary. This is an academic commentary that is very trustworthy. And the, the author is David E. Garland. And this is what he says about the issue. He goes, again, uh, Murphy O'Connor, again, represents an increasing number of scholars who think that the problem revolves around hairdos. He argues that an uncovered head is equivalent to dis, uh, disheveled hair. So a woman's not to come to church with disheveled hair, he says. I personally think the issue is much deeper than that. So let me go on and read. He says, while a covered head is carefully tended, uh, is a carefully tended to female hairdo, to have the hair tied up on top of the head rather than hanging loose. Then he goes on to say this. The assumption is that it is shameful for a woman to unbind their hair in public. Why? Because in the Roman culture, in order to let your hair down, that was associated with prostitution or to be a loose woman. So in the culture of this day, uh, paganism said if a woman wore her hair loose, it was a sign of prostitution. 
So when a Christian woman came into church or when she was in public, she was to have her hair covered or up or her hairdo was to be short. That was the culture of that day. A Christian woman was not to look like a prostitute by having her hair long. Now, there's argument today of, well, that was a cultural context. You have to under, uh, interpret that in light of the cultural context. I, I, Paul says in this passage also that men were not to have long hair. I think the point that Paul's getting at is there ought to be a clear distinction between a man and a woman. Okay? So I think there's an argument for that. A woman ought to look like a woman and a man ought to look like a man. I believe that's the point that Paul is saying. Uh, men are not to look like women, and women are not to look like men, and women are not to look like pagan prostitutes. Again, we understand the cultural context of that today. Uh, now, when women have long hair, no one thinks that they're a Roman prostitute or a pagan prostitute. Um, I'm going to read to you from another source that seems to agree with that. This is the Pillar New Testament commentary which is also a, a critical commentary. It's an academic commentary. And this one says the same thing. That, uh, that the issue here is, has to do more or less with uh, the issue of looking like a prostitute. Now, let me read it to you. Here it is. Um, we have argued that in this letter, Paul is concerned above all with the infiltration of Roman and Corinthian values and lifestyles into the church. A special interest is the influence of sexual morality or idolatry for which pagan Gentiles were infamous in Jewish thinking. A move toward the abandonment of the female head covering would have struck many at that time as a move towards licentiousness or more sexual provocate, uh, a provocative way of appearing in public, precisely the kind of social influence Paul is anxious to avoid. So again, both of these scholars' uh, commentaries say that the issue has to deal with being sexually provocative, okay? Because a Corinthian pagan and a Roman pagan woman would have had their hair down in public. It would have been a sign of her sexual provocativeness. So a Christian woman was to look different, okay? That was the cultural context. Therefore, should a woman have her hair up in a bun today? Does the Scripture mandate that? Or does the Scripture mandate that a woman should have a veil covering the top of her head? Well, there would be some faithful brothers and sisters who say yes, and I respect them for that. But I personally don't believe that understanding context mandates that that should be done today. Why? Because our cultural context. No one looks at a woman today in our society with their hair down and say, well, there's a prostitute like they did with Corinthian and Roman context in that day. Okay? And I believe that there's also an argument that that. Paul says men shouldn't have long hair. Why? Because a man should look like a man and a woman should look like a woman. And, um, and so that's a whole other question, isn't it, for another day. So I hope that answers your question. The second question I have for today is, it says this, I'm a teacher at a local high school. I've been working hard in providing students with opportunities to, pre to prepare them for life after high school. Lately, though, the leader of the high school has been putting much pressure on myself and my team saying we are not doing our job when, in a sense, we are doing what is right. And what I believe God has led us to do, which is providing these students with skills and opportunities that will enrich their life after graduation. What am I supposed to do with the negativity from the high school leader? What do I do when all the leader wants to do? is to bring my team and I down. Well, first of all, let me just say I'm sorry that you're under that type of leadership. But there's a couple of things I want to share with you, okay? And, and hear me through to the very end before you make a judgment call. In the book of Ephesians, um, Paul says this. 
Okay. He says, uh, um, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling and with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a with good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Now, of course, the context is talking about how slaves should react to their masters and masters to their slaves. We know that the the Bible does not condone slavery, but it does acknowledge that slavery was prominent in this day. And so Paul is saying, if you're a Christian slave, then this is how you should respond to your master. Now, if we bridge that to the cultural context of our day, we would say, this is how An employee should respond to their boss. He says, again, uh, obey your earthly masters, obey your boss with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So every Christian has a responsibility to represent Christ in their employment. And that takes humility, and that takes submission. Now, if your boss is leading you to do something that's against Christ or against the Bible, then of course you've got to obey Christ. But if they're just merely saying, this is your job, this is what I've asked you to do, and you need to do it. Well, there's a sense where you need to obey your boss, okay? And that best represents Uh, that best represents Christ through your obedience, okay? And through your humble behavior, who knows? You may win your boss's heart over. Um, Another passage I want to read to you is from Romans chapter 12. And Paul says this in Romans 12, verse 9. Let your love be genuine. Ahoard what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, and be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who uh, weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that that speaks right to your situation. He says, listen, show good, overcome overcome evil with good, show brotherly affection, show honor, uh, and uh, be constant in prayer, be patient in tribulation. And bless instead of curse. Okay? So it takes humility. It takes a lot of prayer. I'm sorry that you're in the condition that you are, apparently under some type of poor leadership. Um, But God has you in this for a reason. And He's going to mold and He's going to make your your character. He's going to use this tribulation to make you the person that He wants you to be and also your other, your friends. And this is an opportunity for you to best show Christ in your situation. So thank you for your question today. Um, Well, I I believe that's all the time that we have for today. And so uh, thank you for your questions. Until we meet again, serve the King.